Professor uh, Francesca uh, Klug and uh, uh, OB and uh, Jonathan Cooper OB, uh, both of whom are uh, seminal academic architects of the debates and then the developments that eventually provided the foundation for the introduction of the Human Rights uh, Act. Uh, uh, Dimitrios, thank you. And it's great to be part of this event. And this event is, is itself remarkable and a great opportunity to celebrate uh, the European Convention on Human Rights and obviously, of course, the, the Human Rights Act. And we are amazingly fortunate to have Francesca here because, as I'm sure everyone on this call knows, Francesca was the principal architect of the Human Rights Act. And it was her painstaking work throughout the 90s that actually created a model that could then be slotted in seamlessly into the UK system of government. But obviously, when we're acknowledging the work of, of Francesca, we do also uh, have to acknowledge the work of others. And there was one other titan along with Francesca, who was there creating the architecture that we now all know and most of us love, which is the Human Rights Act. And that's Anthony Lester. And we have to pay tribute to him and the great tragedy of his passing earlier this year. Um, Anthony is just remarkable. And I can't express in words how much I owe him um, for my understanding of, of how human rights work and their importance. And he's an extraordinary, extraordinary man. And I, I very much hope that we'll get a, a special issue of the European Human Rights Law Review, um, which will focus on his five ideas um, to fight for. And that his last book, Those Five Ideas, if you haven't read it, go and read it. It'll inspire you during this next phase of, of lockdown. So it's a great opportunity, Dimitrios. Thank you for allowing me to pay tribute to, to Anthony. Um, but we're here really to have this discussion with Francesca about where the future of the Human Rights Act lies. And inevitably in that process, we will look back um, to the origins of the Human Rights Act, as well as how the Human Rights Act is functioning and then ask ourselves those very difficult questions. Where um, where are we going to go? Where will the Human Rights Act go? I just love listening to you, Francesca. So, and I'm sure everyone does as well. And so this is our moment to understand how the Human Rights Act came into being and really where we, you, uh, think it's going. So um, why don't you just kick off with, with, with that question? Where do you think it's going to go? Well, yeah, I mean, the word struggle has been used a lot today, and I've been really affected by that because that doesn't always come up at an erudite legal seminar like we're all participating in today. So I, I think it's worth for a second before we talk about where we're going to go, consider the, the struggle that actually led to the Human Rights Act. And I'm going back, actually, uh, long before any of us can remember, and I'm, I'm making a guess here that none of us, um, and, and, and I, I, apologies if I've got this wrong, but that none of us were around um, when the European Convention on Human Rights was drafted and before it, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I want to put those two in the same sentence because perhaps that's one thing we haven't uh, focused on at all so far, which is the ECHR. We're told the anodyne story, aren't we? That this is yet another version of British glory, our wonderful leader, Winston Churchill, having defeated the Huns and saved the whole of Europe, then introduced the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, you know, far be it for me to totally demolish that narrative because it's important and useful to point out that this was not a lefty human rights lawyer event, as uh, Priti Patel might call it. Um, it did come from a, a deep sense that something needed to be done at the end of the Second World War here in Europe, the epicenter of the war, to stop it ever happening again. And there's no doubt Churchill and he sent David Maxwell Fife to draft the European Convention on was a big promoter and supporter of the idea of it. That's beyond doubt. But it didn't start there in any way whatsoever. <laughs> it started from a long struggle um, of, of NGOs, lawyers, academics, people like ourselves, and people, say, less versed in the law than most of us, 
campaigning for some kind of international bill of rights during the second world war in particular as a as a product of seeing that the 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 state that human beings can take themselves to, to the very precipice of existence. And there was a sense that, you know, the Enlightenment National Bills of Rights that, you know, the Europe and the West had extolled as, 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 as evidence of how, what a superior civilization we had, had actually completely failed, <laughs> and I mean that, completely failed, <laughs> to protect life, liberty, human dignity, and any sense that we were one humanity here, in Europe. So it, it was that struggle, big struggle, that led to the UN Charter after the San Francisco Conference and NGOs lobbying like mad, writing draft bills of rights, it, you know, while the bombs were falling on them, um, that led to the, to, to the powers that be accepting that human rights should appear in the UN Charter. That was not inevitable. That was a product of struggle. Then the UDHR draft itself, although it was, you know, Delegates at, the U delegates at the UN, high level, they brought the struggles of their own cultures and their own peoples unbelievably often to the debates. And I'm not saying it was perfect, and the whole of sub-Saharan Africa was, of course, still under imperial rule, and we should never forget that. But nevertheless, it, it was a mixture of cultures and creeds and philosophies that led to that extraordinary document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I've studied virtually all of the debates on it. And if ever you find in the lockdown that you've got through all your box sets, I do recommend reading some of those debates. Shabazz, the, the, the author, has put them all together, but you can get them online. And I, and I cover some of them in my last book I'm plugging away here called The Magna Carta for All Humanity. It's just, they're just so real and live and so relevant for now. Anyway, in the Council of Europe, when it when it was formed, which Churchill was, of course, you know, hugely in favour of, it, you know, they originally just wanted to basically take the UDHR, which we know was, was a non-justiciable statement of values and a direction of travel. And actually, I have the view that it was very important it was non-justiciable, because I don't think any of the subsequent massive treaties that it procreated would ever have happened had we not started out with these broad brush values. But anyway, that's another debate. They just basically wanted to turn that into a legal document. And it was Britain's contribution to hedge it about <laughs> with far more limitations and put a black letter law stamp on it. That, that's not to take away our role, but it is to put it in context. And it, the one, reason why that's important, to be honest, is because this was these 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 amazing instruments and all that's come out of them. I do not believe they would have that effect if they were simply the result of some, you know, white elite men thinking, oh, we better draft something here, you know, a resolution that makes us look like we care about these things and the Cold War was starting and we better show, you know, the difference between us and the and the commies. It, 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 the story is much deeper and richer than that. And, and so it's a, it's a very endearing way of looking at the history of, of the ECHR, which your students will be delighted by. But it also has this great observation in it, where Maxwell, what, Maxwell Fife writes back saying, unlike the, basically unlike the French or the UDHR or, uh, and the UN, we managed to get a court and an enforceable document. And there's something really endearing about that. And he recognized the need for that um, hard edged document that could be enforced. So, um, you know, it, it, it's it's terribly important that we go back to those. Uh, and those that schools. was a trade off, wasn't it, Jonathan? I mean, you know, in all, you know, maybe the black letter lawyerish bits in the in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that we call the European Convention on Human Rights. And of course, it also cut off all the economic, social and cultural rights. And Britain was at the forefront of that as well. Um, but maybe that's what, what that was the only way we were going to ever get the enforcement that we have had and all the impacts that have been discussed so far today. So so what you've got oh. here is, is an inspiration and then a, a hard legalisation. Yeah. But Francesca, I want to pick up on that word that you picked up on that people have been using throughout the morning, which is struggle. And so we saw the struggle for the UDHR, struggle for the ECHR. And then can you just sort of put us in context of the struggle for the HRA? Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, actually, Colm, I think it was Colm and it was one other contributor, talked about 
you know, the, 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 the paucity of the common law and how restricted it was. And even at the time you had judges like the whole Bingham lamenting, you know, in Smith, the, 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 the gaze, as it was called, the gaze in the military case at the time. Uh, I think that's about the time you and I met each other, wasn't it, Jonathan? Um, you know, saying, you know, I wish that I could judge this on the basis of human rights because, you know, uh, you know, gay and lesbian men and women, their human rights are being completely eviscerated here. I'm paraphrasing here, but I can't. I just have to judge it on the on the on the basis of whether these regulations are are legal or irrational. And on that basis, I have to say they're not. But there's also the sense of powerlessness. And this is where struggle comes in again. I mean, I, as a young person, was asked to go on the Charter 88 Council, uh, which was formed in 1988. It was it was an elite pressure group, but but it was reflecting a sense of discontent, not dissimilar to now in many ways, of young people feeling there was nothing we could do about one sort of draconian legislation after another or a draconian measure like broadcasting bans, book bans, um, you know, taking away the right to silence, taking away ears fully. There was no constitutional measure. There was no constitutional means to really address those, to challenge them. We either went on the streets or we waited for another election where the same party kept winning on a minority vote. And out of that came a demand for a series of constitutional reforms, including a Bill of Rights. And to cut a long story short, the Human Rights Act came out of the demand for a Bill of Rights. It did not really come out of the demand for the incorporation of the European Convention to UK law, which really was a very, very small minority lawyer's preoccupation. But there was a wonderful marriage there and there was a, a cast of characters involved. Um, people have mentioned Lord Leicester. It's far wider than that. I'm not going to name them because you can listen to the podcast Jonathan and I did on this, where we remembered most names except the great late Gareth Williams, um, where we talk about the origins of the Human Rights Act. Adam Wagner made the podcast for Doughty Street Changes. It's called Better Humans. And in case you've got any doubt, that doesn't refer to Jonathan and me. Um, in, in the end, though, the new Labour government, it it achieved bring, bring, bringing the Human Rights Act into being in 20 years ago. Of course, it's the anniversary of the Human Rights Act coming into effect. Um, 20 years ago, just a month ago, was the anniversary, 20th anniversary of the Human Rights Act. You notice, by the way, how the government has been doing all these wonderful celebrations. It was the UDHR's 70th anniversary last year, the Human Rights Act. 20th anniversary last month, and now the ECHR, with, we have to rely on you, Demetrius, to, to celebrate it, because in this country, we don't celebrate any of that. But I remember being in, in Paris and um, the Garde du Nord uh, at the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and I looked up and I suddenly saw all these huge celebratory posters uh, around the station, and I thought, this is a this is a, an essay in itself. What is it about our country? But anyway, um, the, the, when New Labour introduced it, they had a confusion of objectives. I mean, one objective was simply, you know, they were dismantling a lot of the, if you like, old Labour or soft left uh, programme, and they needed something sounding radical to replace it as internal party management, frankly. And this was John Smith, who died prematurely, his big promise that he would introduce constitutional reform. He really believed in it. He really understood it. He talked about it as a citizen's democracy. Tony Blair, when he became leader, inherited it. Jack Straw was given the task of introducing a, a British Bill of Rights. They called it the Human Rights Act. They based it on the European Convention because on the basis that we were already um, uh, required to conform with the rights in the European Convention on Human Rights in theory. Um, and they wanted really it to be a very, very minimalist technical achievement. On the other hand, they knew they needed to sound like it was a big radical change. And so they made all sorts of promises of this being the, the biggest hum, human rights bill of rights since the 1689 Bill of Rights, you know, cultural change, public authorities are now going to absorb human rights in their culture. So people didn't really know what it was about. They were very, very confused. They didn't know if this was a British Bill of Rights or this was simply the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights. And the reality is, in a word, is that it took the rights in the convention, but not all of them. It bolstered a couple of rights on free, free expression and, and, and freedom of conscience for all sorts of nefarious motives, but but I won't go there now. Um, and it created a model by which it would act as a Bill of Rights so that our courts were not meant to be slavishly following the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. People will have different views about that. But the reason was is it was meant to be something independent and ours and belonging to us. And I don't quite agree with Brenda Hale there or Colm either, where 
you know, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't make any difference whether we had our own Bill, Bill, British Bill of Rights and repeal the Human Rights Act or not. That would have been fine to call it a British Bill of Rights, which I personally asked them to do um, in the first place, and then we would build on it. But to give out the message that you have to repeal a human rights treaty in order to introduce something called a British Bill of Rights, i.e. you can't just build on it, but you have to repeal it, is to slant how you perceive this new bill. And I do take the view that bills of rights of any descriptions are far more than the legal entitlements written on a piece of paper. Uh, this relates to the last, um, to Constantine, your, your, your points about the European Court of Human Rights. I would say the same thing about the Human Rights Act. It is far more than just a set of legal entitlements. It's a framework of, by which we understand our democracy. And I think it's a huge signal to repeal the Human Rights Act in order to introduce a British Bill of Rights. It's saying this is something where we are distancing ourselves from the international human rights framework. And it's, it's exceptional introduction of the idea of humans first, as opposed to Britain's first, Americans first, or any other first. Francesca, can we talk a little bit about its impact and the success of it and the kind of cleverness of its structure? And that device that is at the heart of the HRA between Section 3 and Section 6, obviously Section 4 plays its own role, but my sense of the brilliance of it is really that interpretive obligation under Section 3, coupled with the duty on public authorities with that very broad definition, it is what is the sort of genius of it, but then there are the other the other parts of the HRA which have really had a huge um, knock on impact. So section 19 again, I think, is an inspired part of the scheme, um, and then also I'd love it if we could just briefly, briefly talk about whether or not we should have had a human rights commission. Um, back in the day, both Francesca and I were big proponents of the human rights commission um, and whether human rights have got lost within the EHRC and, and how the HRA fits into the scheme of the, uh, the EHRC and equality law more generally. And so if we could just for a moment talk about that impact. And, uh, and just by way of introduction to this discussion, there was that extraordinary piece of work by David McKinley back in, in the mid 90s, where he identified the extent of which of which Parliament was passing laws that clearly violated uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. And my memory is it was as much as two thirds of all um, secondary legislation was being passed that violated um, the, the ECHR. And so looking at the problems in the United Kingdom where the UK had been found to violate rights across the board, the UK system of government couldn't, wasn't functioning when matched against the ECHR in terms of, of rights delivery, uh, and Parliament was the chief villain in many respects because it was passing that legislation. So how, um, how did the Human Rights Act, what has it done to the, the, the shift and is it appropriate to say that we have developed a culture of rights? Would you argue that that, that sort of aspiration that people like Andrew Puffett were arguing for, a culture of rights, is being achieved by, by the HRA? I think Demetrius will get very cross with us if I try to <laughs> address that entire field because it's a massive question. And I, I know I've spoken far too long already about various things. But the, so, so can I cut to the chase, Jonathan? I mean, first yeah. of all, I want to acknowledge the role you play in getting the Joint Committee on Human Rights um, up and running, um, which I think has been very, very important for getting parliamentarians to think about human rights. I mean, people who are listening to this who, who, who weren't necessarily fully fledged adults by the time the Human Rights Act came in will just not necessarily realise that human rights, the very term, was hardly ever used to address human beings in Britain, because the whole point was, was that human rights was something foreigners lacked. And we already had, we had civil liberties, and we already had the greatest liberty that any nation could ever have, starting with the Magna Carta. So that was the discourse. And the fact that the fact is, parliamentarians hadn't got a clue about what human rights were, by and large. And the Joint Committee on Human Rights has played and is playing right now in the pandemic, a very important educative and contemplative 
role within Parliament about what human rights are and what they mean and how you balance different rights and all the rest of it. The Commission is another story, um, but absolutely, as Jonathan said, he and I initially with Anthony and others were, were fighting for a, com a self-standing Commission, which I think would have perhaps been found it easier to have a, a more, if you like, culture promotion role than, than, than has been the case because of the difficulty of merging lots of different bodies. But this was the only way it was ever going to happen. And I think that the, the Commission is, is gradually finding its feet in, in more and more difficult times. Let me just say, somebody said earlier, I, I think it was Vera, that you know human rights seem very abstract for most people. And I'm not, I'm not going to argue with that as a, as, as, as a, as a, as a generalised point, but I, I think we've seen a bit of a shift in the 20 years of the Human Rights Act. I mean, in the very early days, the reason why the Labour, new Labour turned against it, having been very confused, as I said, what its objectives were when they introduced it and giving different narratives to different people, um, was because it became an impediment, didn't it? But it, after 9-11, which was less than a year after the human rights came in, it, you know, in very crude terms, it stopped it being able to deport foreign national suspects or detain them with, indefinitely without trial. Uh, the famous Belmarsh case. And then they, they realised they hadn't just introduced a technical measure and it wasn't just a piece of fluff. This was real law. And they basically briefed against it. Um, but now I, I actually think since the Human Rights Act come, led to such um, outcomes as the Hillsborough Inquiry, the prosecution of John Warboys, the overturning of the bedroom tax, for disabled people who need a spare room, the establishment of an inquiry into the use of do not resuscitate notices in the middle of a pandemic, even now leading today to the government announcing guidelines on allowing um, family members to visit their elderly relatives in care homes because of, of a threatened judicial review under the Human Rights Act. I think the government would have a fight on its hands if it tries to repeal the Human Rights Act and withdraw from the Chemical Convention and or both. Um, because I think it has begun to impact a much, much wider community of people. And I'm not saying that they could all stand up and articulate what the Human Rights Act has done for them in the way we are doing now. And that that is a that is an obligation on all of us, as some as other people have commented. You know, you'll be we're being threatened of, of being outed as lefty human rights lawyers, do-gooders with their grand theories of human rights. We're trying to, they're trying to silence us. And I think we have duties as academics, as lawyers and as citizens to just explain it as it is and to help people understand what it is that they might lose in the most plain language we possibly can. And also not necessarily to defend every judgment because we don't have, always agree with every judgment. That's okay. But to explain the framework within which the judgments were made. So I think in this sense, John, Jonathan, very much, you know, via the law and these organs that didn't exist before the Human Rights Act, like the Joint Committee and the Commission, you know, gradually, 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 the Human Rights Act is being made itself felt in everyday life. But I just, you know, I know we're going to be told to stop now. So I feel as if it is my duty to just respond to your first question, which I failed to do, Jonathan, in, in a word, which is the, what's going to happen now. I think we could miss a trick. The attacks on the human rights have gone through three phases. The new Labour one, when it was just kind of, it's a pain in the neck, it's stopping us doing what we want. The David Cameron man, where it was partly a proxy for the Brexit wars when he couldn't, before he could conduct them. And actually almost the opposite end he was coming from. This was a small state government and the human rights that was empowering too many people to uh, fight bureaucrats, not so much the torture and the, and, the, and the detention without trial issues, but actually the everyday issues is what the Cameron government really, you know, health and safety and human rights. Do you remember them putting it in the same sentence? That's what they were trying to fight. And that's what Grayling's uh, when he, Justice Secretary, advisory paper, uh, proposing replacing the Human Rights Act with the British Bill of Rights, that really was one of their main targets. But of course, this paper proposing a British Bill of Rights added no rights at all, qualified what was there and was proposing removing these trivial rights. Now with Johnson, we're on to the third stage. Brexit is, quote, over. So this is now part of a much bigger cultural war about foreigners, about Britain, Brit Britain rights, rights for British people, about a sense of intrusion and national sovereignty being hermetically sealed except for the European Court of Human Rights, as, as Dominic Cunnings and Michael Grove at different times have effectively said. It's, so it's about a culture war. It's about a pop at the Labour Party and the lead of the Labour Party in particular, with all the references to human rights lawyers. And it is about a sense of travel, of where we're going to be, which is why this is the most extraordinary day of for having this conversation. Because the, the American 
elections, I don't need to tell you all, are almost certainly going to determine what we understand by democracy in the years to come. We have this association of illiberal demo democracies now setting up their own institution to fight the EU on this, liberal and hungry, spurred on by Trump. And we are part of this club. In fact, we were outliers by challenging the very authenticity and legitimacy of universal and international human rights. If, if, if what Johnson's talking about now is not introducing a British Bill of Rights, that's yesterday's debate. It doesn't feature anywhere in the 2019 manifesto. We need to, to keep with the project. What they're talking about now is uh, amending and updating the Human Rights Act. And that means basically eviscerating it of its punch and its universalism and its internationalism as far as they can. And we have to be smart about it because they will forever, forever dress this up in warm words. That's why when we were children, we learned the story of Red Riding Hood. The wolf comes looking like grandma, but it's now up to us to face this new struggle. That's okay, Francesca, and if I can have uh, just a couple of minutes. Sorry. Yeah. OK, I, 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 I agree with everything that you have just said. And I just want to make that observation again that I said at the beginning in my introduction that how well crafted um, the HRA was, which was thanks to your hard work. And I think it is incumbent upon us to be equally well prepared for this next stage in the fight for human rights protection in, in the United Kingdom. And again, picking up on what's going on in the United States today, we will follow the model of their commission into what they consider to be important or unimportant rights and um and the real victims of unimportant rights um probably certainly internationally for the united states will be the global lgbt community and so therefore if there's going to be a knock-on impact of that in relation to what goes on in our discussion around rights i think we can be sure that there will be less protection for the LGBT community. And it is interesting how the Human Rights Act has been so instrumental in clearly and firmly establishing LGBT equality. I mean, the, the Gaydon and Mendoza case probably being the most important of all, where it pointed out how Section 3 is to be interpreted under the Human Rights Act, and you interpret it to give the, the right answer, i.e. Mr Gaydon can inherit his dead lovers apartment um, and that is what section three does and my real concern is that that's what they will dilute even if they, they may decide to say well we can keep the hra more or less as it is but we're going to dilute that interpretive obligation in section three and once you do that mr guider doesn't get the flat and it's those issues really when we we saw the need for the human rights act around prisoners there's no uh, no coincidence or accident that the first case under the HRE even before it was enforced was about searching prisoners cells. Those types of um, unaccountable conduct on the part of the state that liberties could never deal with. And I'll just conclude with an interesting debate that I'm having with many members or some members of my chambers where I just want to get rid of liberties. Can't we just sit, can't we just be human rights? Why does it always have to be human rights and, and civil liberties? Just get rid of civil liberties. You know, the legal 500, just take out. And, and you know, and, and by retaining civil liberties, we are giving them exactly what they need. They'll say, we can get rid of the Human Rights Act or dilute it or water it down because after all, we've got civil liberties. and. Civil liberties have never been there for the most vulnerable. They really haven't. There may be exceptional circumstances, but they've never been there. It was the it was the European Convention that gave us the alphabet cases that gave us the Children Act. It was the European Convention that gave us mental health protection and the mental health regime that we, we have. It was the Human Rights Act or the European Convention rather that's, that paved the way to what we now consider to be LGBT equality in this country. So children, migrants, prisoners, people detained for mental health reasons, the really vulnerable get their rights through the Human Rights Act and the, that very, very clever scheme that, to be honest, Francesca painstakingly devised. Fascinating. They will, they, they will take us out of the European Union without a plan. Francesca took us into the ECHR with a deeply thought through plan, which is why it could seamlessly move into the UK system of government. So I all credit to 
to Francesca and Dimitrios to you two for this brilliant event. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, both uh, for such an insightful, uh, dynamic, passionate uh, analysis. Uh, your, uh, your passion, uh, Francesca, uh, Jonathan, uh, they're, they're, they're infectious. Uh, it, it is infectious. It is uh, precisely what, what we need uh, as a driving force. Uh, in uh, in this uh, debate, I, I don't I don't think I can emphasize that uh, that enough. Uh, uh, Ed uh, too, I saw Ed Bates. Uh, um, you know, I, th I think he summarizes perfectly by saying, "Well said, Francesca, brilliant." Uh, that that is exactly uh, the the kind of message that that we needed all along. You know, with the European Convention of Human Rights, uh, with the EU debate. Of course, we we never had the enthusiasm there. We had we never had. Uh, uh, the moral, personal investment uh, in, in the European project vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis those that were supposed to be leading uh, in, uh, in that respect. I mean, we, we know that uh, Jeremy Corbyn gave the European Union a six or a seven, was it? I can't, I can't quite uh, remember. Uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, David Cameron, four years, uh, was uh, a, a critic, uh, of, harsh critic of, of the European uh, Union uh, project, and and so we are facing. I, I think it's quite clear from from your uh, uh, presentation, the presentations that preceded uh, that, uh, uh, similar threats, uh, and we need to act swiftly. We need to act with uh, urgency. I think to, today's uh, celebration, today's anniversary, uh, offers a stark reminder of of the threat we are facing vis-a-vis uh, -vis foundational constitutional, the foundational constitutional document when it comes to the protection of human rights in this uh, country. I think, you know, go a few years back, nobody would have predicted uh, that uh, the day would come uh, that Britain would be the first uh, member state to leave the European Union. And so we need to make sure that we're not complacent uh, in an equally similarly dangerous uh, way with respect uh, uh, to the Human uh, Rights uh, Act. I mean, I hear what everyone is saying about potentially you know, the narrative has changed, we can, perhaps we're no longer speaking, we are no longer speaking about the Bill of Rights, but perhaps the, the current narrative could be even more dangerous, you know, it could be doing it way by stealth. Ed uh, highlighted how uh, contracting parties uh, are actually withdrawing their financial support, their practical support, their moral support uh, to the European Court of Human Rights. There is significant danger uh, uh, there. There is significant risk in the fact that the that the UK, even if it's not finally going to move in that direction, the, the simple fact that it has been discussing for years on end, communicating the message across Europe uh, and beyond uh, to the many liberal democracies that exist, communicating the message that uh, you know we can do away potentially with human rights, uh, that I think is destructive, intrinsically destructive in, uh, in itself. Uh, a final observation, the, the, the interesting distinction, well known human rights experts between human rights uh, on the one hand, civil liberties on the other, I think also very interestingly comes into play in the current debate uh, on, on COVID. So we have been faced uh, with uh, uh, the paradoxical situation where you have genuine uh, uh, adversaries to the Human Rights Act, suddenly speaking, about human rights and about individual uh, individual rights. I think Lord Samson, if I may say so, with respect, uh, provides a characteristic case uh, study. Uh, we, we know that he has uh, been an important critic of the Human Rights Act, and yet uh, for the last three or four uh, months, he's been focusing attention on uh, on, on how uh, you know the lockdown uh, is restricting our rights. But it, it's a very narrow uh, view that I feel, and we've previously discussed that with Jonathan, that he's, uh, he's been taking on, on this question. So, Can I just thank you, Dimitris, for inviting us? And can I also say, you know, it's been brilliant listening to everybody. And it's really important that we understand that however kind Jonathan is, the Human Rights Act really was a collective endeavour by a lot of people, a lot of brains and a lot of commitment. And now we need a new collective endeavour. So thanks very, very much for having me. It's been brilliant.